You second. That wasn't me. Oh. It was Mary Hunkler that said second. Okay, thank you, Mary. Bob Ford here. Okay, good. We can hear you. Uh, uh, who, uh, if I may, real quick, Grant, who again made the motion to approve the minutes? The general. Okay. General Scott. If I heard that right. Okay. Correct. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, all in favor, raise their hand. That their video and opposed, raise their hand, and then I will ask for aud audible answers from those on the phone. Any, all in favor, say aye. 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 And, and all those on the phone that are against it, say nay. Okay, so it's unanimously approved. Um, Walter, would you like to give the financial report? Yes, sir, I will. Walter, you have the uh, June financials and the July financials. Since July is the most recent, I suppose we'll concentrate on them. Um, first of all, does anybody have any questions? Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. We've drawn down, Jim drew down all of the federal funds. So our uh, total equity is $265,000. And we show a, uh, at the end of uh, July, we show a net income of $125,000. $620.95, and you will no doubt, since we've drawn down the majority of our income, there's a little bit left, I think 35000 we uh, anticipate coming in, but you will probably see that shrink as the year proceeds, so don't be alarmed at that. Any, any questions? If not, can we, do we need to, to accept the financial report? Or to take a motion, you, would you move to accept the report? I would, I would move on behalf of the finance committee. <coughs> second, please. I would second. Okay, Kevin seconds. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? All on the phone say aye. Aye. And opposed? Okay, we've got uh, housekeeping a little bit first. Uh, Jim, would you tell us the two names on the um, two phone numbers? They're That's what I, I was going to ask you to stop to do. Uh, who, it, whose phone ends in 4775, please? Eight one six three. Eight one six three three. Well, that seems a digit short. Eight one six three 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 four seven seven five. Who is that? That's Kay Barnes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Mayor. I'm uh, changing your number to your name so that the other folks in the meeting can see that. And then 816-679-1297. It's Dwayne Benton at the car dealer. Good to hear you, Judge. Great to be here. All right. Go ahead, Walter, with your... Next issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of the foundation, uh, Jim sent out requests for proposals to perform two audits and provide <laughs> three 990s. Those are the tax returns, returns that we do every year. Uh, we received three proposals ranging from a high of 31325 down to a low of 22150 the low bidder was uh, Jared Gilmore and Phillips, PA, and they're located in Chanute, Kansas. Uh, they are, and I will say that, uh, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, it, it was performed under duress, but the last, uh, there were some time constraints. The last audit we had for one year and, and a, a filing of a 990 cost us in the neighborhood of $20,000. So 
this was for, again, this was for two audits and provide three 990s. Um, the, the low bidder uh, also submitted an alternative recommendation that they provide an, ad an additional audit for only $2,700 over the life of the contract. And after review, the finance committee recommends to accept their proposal, including their suggestion that we have our books audited annually. We think that's the correct fiduciary, uh, certainly fulfills our fiduciary responsibility. So on behalf of the finance committee, I make the motion that the board authorize Jim Ogle to enter into an agreement with Jared Gilmore and Phillips PA to provide three audits and three federal form 990s uh, at the submitted bid of $24,850. It needs no second. A motion. It's a, that's the motion and it needs no second since it's a committee motion. Is there any discussion on this or any questions about the um, proposal? Yes, Gary. Uh, so just from my understanding, this takes us through what uh, fiscal year? It was the 2019 uh, audit and return and return uh, 20 and 21, 2019 through 2021. Okay, so I, I, I'm good with that. Um, my only question is, um, given the difficult to predict funding from the federal government. Is there a way to put a clause in that should should um, we not get funded from the government that we would not execute the entire document? In other words, the final audit. I just want to. I don't want to enter a contract that convict that commits us to paying a certain amount if we don't end up needing all of those services. I'm certain that's something that Jim could negotiate into the contract. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other thoughts or discussion? Okay, again, with the, we will vote on the motion with those on the video to please raise their hand in favor. And anybody opposed, raise your hand. Okay, those on the phone, uh, say aye. Aye. Those on the aye. phone, say nay. Okay, the ayes have it unanimously again. Mr. And Chairman, I'd you? like to yield the balance of my time to my esteemed colleague, Mr. Jim Ogle. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. Um, uh, you have... Originally, I sent out June financials, but we also then received our July financials, and um, we had both a uh, balance sheet and a profit and loss uh, statement that takes us through the um, end of July, and I'm open to any questions you may have about that. Looks like none. Okay, then uh, to uh, fill you in on the uh, process associated with the PPP, um, the quote loan we took out uh, that uh, is supposed to convert into a grant. Uh, currently, uh, we are advised by our bank, Central National Bank, um, through the form of little humorous cartoons they send about once every week that they don't know nothing and they can't tell us nothing <coughs> about the process. There is an expectation that as part of some eventual uh, coronavirus relief effort, Congress will exempt all loans below a certain amount of money and just say they're all forgiven and you don't need to do any paperwork. And I will be, find that to be gratifying if that is true. So uh, we have the paperwork to support 
um, the original terms of the agreement and if Congress wants to make uh, the system work out that we don't have to turn anything, that's great too. But uh, I have no expectation that this is going to convert into a loan and I expect it to be fully forgiven along the way. Can you remind us of the amount of that loan? Uh, it's 52,000, my apologies. Let me grab the exact number here. Oh, that's close enough, Jim. It's, it's $52,000 and some odd cents as I've been reading some newspaper articles uh, by other organizations that have received loans of very modest amount, uh, I was surprised that so many organizations got in the millions of dollars. Um, okay, so any other comments you wanna make about your re the financial report, Jim? I have no further comments, I'm open to questions. Or Walter? No, Anybody I have nothing else. Any other questions on the finances? Grant, yes. uh, your comment about the amounts of the PPP, did we just not have enough imagination in terms of the <laughs> amount applied for? That's certainly not. true. I apparently don't have the kind of imagination. Uh, we had uh, four full-time employees uh, that we could qualify for payment uh, for at the time. And uh, that's, uh, it depended on your what your payroll was um, on average for a uh, basically 75 day period in 2019, what your average payroll was. It couldn't be part-time and it couldn't be any employee making over $100,000 a year. Uh, anything above $100,000 a year had to be exempted. And since we don't have that many employees, it, their uh, payroll plus their um, uh, benefits, uh, like the health insurance payments, were the only elements that and our rent that we could qualify for. It's never stood in the way of the president. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I do not see uh, Deb Barker. Is she not here? I would then ask Mary if you would be able to make the report of the Board Development uh, Committee on the election of Kate Blocker and Kelly. And is, is it Sartorius? Is that correct? All right, well, yeah. pretty good guess. All right. Um, Mary? I, I believe that um, there, there was information about, attached to the minutes, their backgrounds. They're both very qualified. And so uh, do you need a motion at this point, Grant? Well, it would be the committee's motion that we elect them. Is that correct? The Board Development Committee recommends, and I move that Kate Blocker and Kelly Sartorius uh, be admitted as board members to Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area. National Heritage Area. Uh, that needs no second. Um, uh, uh, is there any discussion on this motion? Okay, then again, we will take a vote on the motion. If those that are on the video would raise their hand in favor. Opposed, do the same. And those on the phone say aye. Aye. And those on the phone say nay. Why, we have it unanimously, and I would give uh, the opportunity for Kate and Kelly to make a few uh, remarks to us. Kate, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Uh, I joined, joined a few of you last month on a Zoom call, and I enjoyed getting to meet those of you that were on that, and I'm privileged to be sitting on your trustees. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly? Uh, thank you as well. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to serve on this board. I'm a historian, and my father's roots are on that 
that I live in Lawrence, but my father's roots are in that um, great state of Missouri where they dig up Civil War bullets all the time on my family farm. So this is a real pleasure for me. It's, it's home in both sides. So thank you very much for the invitation. Well, we're very lucky to have both of you on our board and thank you for joining us. Um, and um, I guess we'll move to old business. Um, and we are uh, fortunate to have Angel Tucker here to present to us, a board member, by the way, to present to us a proposal uh, for some additional funding for the Kansas City Race Project. Um, before we do that, let's make a, uh, that was a recommendation of the um, committee that we provide additional funding. It was that resolution made available, Jim? It is part of the materials I sent out. They were the last parts of the materials today. Okay, so there will there is a, I guess that recommendation is a motion that we'll put on the floor at this time that we would fund the Kansas City Race Project in the amount of ten thousand dollars in two five thousand dollar increments uh and i think maybe procedurally if we have the motion on the floor then it, then we can put angel's presentation about what what we're, what you do with this project uh and give everybody an opportunity to ask questions after you've made your presentation so that everybody we, we can confine our uh, remarks to a given motion uh although I don't mean to confine the conversation. If, if you have uh, questions about the project and the future of the project and the role of Freedom's Frontier, um, please ask. But Angel, would you start by giving us a little background, please? Absolutely. Well, Hello, Gary's everyone. raising his um, hand. Well, I, I didn't get that in time and to see what the uh, uh, recommendation is. So I, if you just read that to us so we know what we're going to be voting on? Yeah, uh, Jim, I don't have it in front of me then. Okay, so um, if I can uh, have you all pause for just a moment as I attempt to bring that back up. I have it. Freedom's Frontier Equality Task Force proposal for race project KC. Freedom's Frontier will provide an outright grant for 2020 through 2021 the grant will be $10,000. Freedom's Frontier will write one check before 12-31-20 from current funds for $5,000. Freedom's Frontier will write a second check after 1-21 for $5,000 after receiving our next federal grant allotment. In return for our unrestricted contribution and support Race Project KC will continue to list Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area as a program sponsor on any materials and any releases discussing the program. End of proposal. Okay, and that's the proposal by the Equality Task Force that's been meeting a committee. So go ahead, Angel. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here today and to present some information to you. I'm going to share my screen. I'm also going to stop my video so that you can focus on what the, the content there. Uh, we're going to do stop video first. Share screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Let's move your face. Put on so a little weight, see. Angel. I put on a little weight. <laughs> so the question um, that Race Project really hones in on is, does race matter? And what we've learned over the last five years is that our experiences shape any given person's response to that question. Um, and to confront racism, we have to ask that question. And in, in a Zoom room like this today, we may all likely say, yes, race absolutely matters. Um, but then again, um, maybe some of us wouldn't. Some of us may say race matters, but it shouldn't or race doesn't matter at all to me, I don't see color. Or some of us may say race isn't as important as social economic differences. Um, and because answers vary depending on the group of individuals um, in a group, confronting racism can at times feel impossible. How do we confront something without a shared pool of meaning? 
Um, in the Johnson County Libraries Initiative Race Project KC, we are asking young people time and time again, does race matter? And while we may know without a doubt race matters, um, we want students first to be able to ask um, what they believe and what they know to be true. And when we think about that, we ask, where do your beliefs come from? And we know that that's our life experiences, tradition, association, authority, evidence, and revelation. And in Race Project, we translate evidence to the stories we've been told and the stories that we tell. So whenever we start Race Project, Casey, we start with a story. So today I'm gonna to give you a story that comes from the place of, of who I am. Who asked this famous question? Rodney King. Um, and footage of Rodney King um, was released in 1991 being um, beaten on the streets of Los Angeles. And I was 11 years old at the time. And to me, King was clearly on the ground, hands were down, and police seemed to be hurting him. And so I was unsure why it was such a big topic of conversation. It became, it seemed clear to me. Um, during the trial, I felt confident that the police officer would be found guilty. Um, and there was no question in my mind. Um, police officers are supposed to protect and serve from an 11 year old's mind. And then this happened and the four officers were acquitted. They hugged and they smiled and I left feeling numb and confused. Uh, people in Los Angeles were not at all numb or confused. The city erupted and the phrase no justice, no peace became a permanent part of my vernacular. Um, protesters took to the streets, riots began, buildings began to burn. Um, the Rodney King riots were in April 1992, and my parents separated, and my mother, sister, and I moved to Kansas City in December of that year. And we actually didn't move to Kansas City. We moved to a small town in Kansas called Atchison, Kansas. Um, and you have to understand, between the months of April and December prior to that move, I had changed. I became hypersensitive to race issues. I went from reading fiction series geared towards middle schoolers to biographies of famous African Americans. In my first few days of seventh grade in Atchison, Kansas, I wore this necklace to school and carried the autobiography of Malcolm X under my arm. I was convinced that I would be the only one of a few black students at the school. Turns out there were plenty of black people in Atchison, Kansas. I made friends fairly quickly and small town life grew on me. I retired my necklace and I didn't think about race for years. Who coined this phrase? If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Johnny Co Cochran, an infamous American attorney who was part of the legal team that represented O.J. Simpson in one of the most notorious murder trials in American history. Um, O.J. was um, acquitted despite a wide array of evidence pointing to his guilt. The reaction to his verdict was quite divisive. Look at these images. And I was in 10th grade, and because I'd grown up in Los Angeles, and I had known about O.J. Simpson and heard about him in the news, I was convinced he was gonna be found guilty. So I was just as shocked. Um, but as you can see, black people and specifically seem to be presenting um, a sheer joy. Uh, and so it was in this moment that I realized that I lived in a town with a division street. And this is an actual street in Atchison. This is a street sign to date. Um, and in that moment, I realized that 80% of people in Atchison lived north of this sign. And um, I knew in that moment what the street represented. And it wasn't until 18 years later though that I would understand the why behind Division Street in Atchison, Kansas when I was introduced to the book, Some of My Best Friends Are Black. In this book, the author weaves his personal truths into the story of integration in America since the civil rights movement. It's divided into four parts, and the book examines the author's own schools in Birmingham, Alabama, neighborhoods in Kansas City, the workplace, and church. The chapters dedicated to Kansas City's neighborhoods answered Rodney King's question, why we all can't just get along? Our country was designed so we would not. Um, the reality of this division is the driving force behind Race Project KC. Racially restrictive covenants, redlining, and blockbusting are the true story of integration in our country. As you all may know, racially restrictive covenants prevented certain races and ethnic groups from owning homes and emerged at the turn of the 20th century. Redlining is the practice of denying or limiting financial services to certain neighborhoods based on racial or ethnic composition without regard to qualifications or creditworthiness. 
Um, and while the use of racial covenants existed before our um, infamous um, J.C. Nichols, the Kansas City developer, he perfected the use. He not only commodified the idea of racialized space, he exported the idea of the development of all white suburban communities um, in Johnson County neighborhoods where I oversee youth services. Um, they were developed as all white enclaves on the peripheral of Kansas City. And so Race Project's primary objective is to offer a serious investigation into the history of racial politics in Kansas City, Johnson County, and its schools and how these issues affect us today. We accomplish this goal by offering multiple opportunities for dialogue between students from different parts of our metro area. We are teaching young people the history of their community, a history that often their parents and grandparents are unaware of. This map is Kansas City. We are revealing that this division, this line between blue and green, is not by happenstance. Our initial event for students was a driving bus landmark tour that brought this truth of segregation into the lens of students as a follow-up conversation at Rockhurst University. We have since developed an audio tour version of this bus tour that is free for anyone to take. It's called Dividing Lines and it's hosted on the site voice map. Uh, we are also revealing this to students the demographic differences of their schools. I mean, these schools on this screen are 9.6 miles apart. Which one do you think sits in the J.C. Nichols all-white uh, community? Um, these students and these schools were the first schools to participate in Race Project KC. Um, to date, students from each of these schools are still involved and together hosted a Black Lives Matter rally in Prairie Village the first week of June of this year. Uh, we are giving students time to get to know each other. Students that would normally, while in high school, never come in contact. To date, we have impacted over 1,500 students. Um, we bring students together through workshops. Uh, we have an annual symposium that brings in our author, Tanner Colby, and other uh, infamous authors like ta Coates and Jacqueline Woodson. We also are reliant on our local community activists like Glenn North and Nicholas Wiggins and Nathan Jackson. Our workshop is about um, identity and bringing students together to understand who they are and how they're viewed. Uh, we step into representation at the Nelson Atkins Museum and think about who is represented in our museums and why. And then we look at the community by taking that segregation audio tour. Um, post COVID or we're going through COVID still, we hope to um, include a workshop on health equity um, and how it relates to COVID. In the past, we've worked with We Are Wyandot to look at health data, and we hope to recreate that workshop. We also want to create content focusing on how to leverage youth voices through the lens of cultivating young writers. We will work with national and local talent to build workshop content with the goal of producing videos, articles, et cetera, that can be shared with the general public about race, equity, and inclusion from our young students' perspective. We again will hold an annual symposium. It will not be in person. We've committed to creating um, some certainty for our students and teachers. We will go 100% uh, online and we'll be working on building that content this year. Again, Race Project is all about agency and it doesn't end here. It starts here. Um, and we know that students with a diverse um, background and an ability to transfer what they learn this slide in particular shows our model that we want peer-to-peer -peer coaching and discussion. Students are more likely to gain knowledge and skill and the ability to transfer what they know because they're sitting side by side with their peers. Um, for the 2020-21 school year, we will work with 12 schools, three cohorts, and six school districts. And we may end up changing that up and pair schools together because when you think about going online, you really have to think about how many students are in one Zoom call. And so we're working on building contingencies so that we can ensure that the experiences are quality. We've also researched that at the end of the day, any more than 2.5 hours online can get daunting. And so we'll probably create workshops that um, will keep those specifics in mind so that we get, get the quality experience for our students. And our, uh, this last slide just gives you a scope of who we're working with and my colleagues. I often get to present about Race Project and I always want to note that I'm one person and there is an incredible team that I work with every single day. What questions do you have? Can you take us back to full screen? Yes, ma'am. Let's see. Mm -hmm. 
Jim, you might have to do it for me. Oh, no, I see it now. Sorry. Stop okay. share. Okay. Great. There we go. Mm -hmm. Questions for Angel? Well, I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, uh, Angel, I think it was an excellent presentation. Um, my question, how are students, uh, how are students informed and What's the criteria for selection? Right now, it's um, per school base. So some schools have clubs. Other schools have call out to say who's in, interested in being a part of this. And so it's kind of a each teacher by teacher base. And our teachers are our primary communicators. We step in prior to COVID, we would step into a classroom in September, October, to update students on what the year was going to be. Um, but we are not involved in the recruitment of students. And we don't have a um, unified criteria of how to gauge student interest. Thank you. I, I would report that to our committee that uh, Angel revealed to us that there are schools that would like to participate that they just don't have the staffing to allow. And um, how many students from each school approximately participate? Yeah, what we have, so we have 12 schools and the total is 20 per school. And so, so you're really planting seeds and mm -hmm. hope they germinate, but it would be wonderful if more people could, could receive it directly and certainly more schools. And yeah. uh, Ray Hill asked the question about age and this, this program is aimed at high school age students. And he suggested that middle school would be really another age group that we sh should try to point towards. So there is good evidence that this program is our best opportunity to start to reach people and educate and make change. Uh, our um, our book club, our 21 day reading group, uh, we, we, we covered a lesson this, this week about educational curriculum uh, in the public schools, uh, Missouri and Kansas, you could look and see. And it's really very minimal what the required teaching for uh, civil rights uh, mm -hmm. and certainly no teaching is required on the issue of white privilege uh, and so really changing those standards is like moving a mountain. It is so much easier to, uh, you know, give, give support to this program uh, and make a difference. Um, what I would hope to see that when we're better staffed is that we provide staffing to maybe find additional partners so that there could be more people engaged in helping angels group uh, so that we could find a way to make it broader. Uh, and, and I think that's going to require more than just Freedom Frontiers partnership. Um, but at this point, uh, this is a significant gift. And, and, you know, Angel, you wear two hats. So I, I recognize that you probably won't vote. But uh, you and Jim discuss the amount. Is that correct? Yes, we did. And I mean, would this, would this amount be significant to the program? Yeah, I think it will allow us to really determine what authors, speakers we bring in. Because again, going back to this idea that we're in a virtual space, and what does it mean to create quality experiences? So I think we're going to have to rely a lot more heavily on bringing in experts. Whereas librarians, we need to really, in a sense, fade to the background to allow the folks that are right in the mix of this work to make sure that our students stay engaged. Because this is a change. Race Project, I mean, what we used to do when you bring students together for six hours, four months in a row, and then they get to interact with ta Coates in person, you can't compare to that. So this idea of the virtual space, we're really going to have to be intentional about what we create. And, and leverage um, experts from the national community to pull in, even if we could pull in a, a someone every single month, the same person. So we're gonna have to get creative. 
and the, the, the thing with what is happening in the community, it's changed our experts and our speakers. I mean, they're being pulled in a million directions. I had a call today with a woman who's written a book about, so you want to talk about race and, you know, her rep says her inbox is just exploding. So uh, funding allows us to say, we have some leverage here. We can put dollars towards this, be a part of something. What other questions do we have? I have one just real quick question. Is the funding or is the program on a every other year assurance or I mean, I know this would be a 2020-2021 grant, but obviously this is just a minor amount of money that you need to do the program. I hope that this is going to be a truly forever program. I mean, I think it has such value and hopefully reward every year. But is there funding guaranteed out in years future? Yeah, we have. So we put a considerable amount of our operating budget towards race project. Um, I oversee an operating budget of 85,000, which covers all of youth services. Um, we put about 15,000 towards race project. We're probably going to see that increased. Um, our library foundation is actively pursuing funders. And so we have seen an influx in donations by individuals to race project. And so I think where, where we get, where it might get tricky for us as a public library is in 2023, when we see the impact of COVID. So we get our, 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 our funding, our operating budget is built by that tax base. And so while we're not seeing the impact now, we're gonna, we will see a difference in the next couple of years. And it's just hard to tell. We also have a funder through the Kauffman Foundation, which they have, they place a considerable amount towards this work. And they also believe it needs to be a program that A, needs to be more broadly impacted in the community and it needs to have continued support. Thank you. Gary, did you have other questions? She, she just answered my question. I saw that Kaufman School was involved, and I wondered. Yeah. Kelly? Um, are you partnering with any of the um, universities in the area at all? Yeah, we do, actually. In a, in a sort of an organic way, we partner with UMKC. Um, we have in the past paid students that they gather. It's their group is called Diversity Ambassadors. And so we have worked with those students that are college students trained on diversity and equity inclusion. And we've had them come in and be mentors and guides for our students. Um, Rockhurst University was a previous partner. Um, we've partnered with MCCC. We've partnered with um, Penn Valley. I mean, we're, what, we're, our approach really is if we're going to bring in speakers, we want that speaker to impact our students and the community. So we always seek additional opportunities for the general public. And usually that's through partnering with um, universities and community colleges. I was just gonna mention, there's a emeritus faculty member at KU, John Rury, whose research includes the development of the Shawnee Mission School District and how race played a role in that. Really? Um, he also might, yeah, he's a historian of education and um, just my background. And he also um, might have some graduate students who might be interested in helping with you as well. So I could put you in touch with him to see if there are any connections if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great because we're also doing some public programming around history and race this fall and we're looking for people to serve on panels. So that would be wonderful if you can put me in touch. Great. Thank you. I can uh, put my yeah. contact information. Yeah. Uh, Angel, are there any uh, reports that the uh, students required to produce or you think that's good enough that it should be shared with the board? I think what you're going to see is this year we're going to have tangible things that we can show you. In the past, what we have created in terms of content has been, have been shared art experiences where they create a zine and we publish it for them. We've also worked with students um, that created a game that can be utilized in uh, classrooms around redlining and blockbusting. We hired some outside contractors to meet with students at I think I always forget the Blue Valley schools. I think it was Blue Valley North. Um, but this year, we're really going to zone in on how do you utilize your voice to create change? What can you produce? Can you create a video? Can you write articles that we can then put out into the community? So I think once we have those, we'll definitely want to share. 
Other thoughts or questions? This is just terribly exciting. I know you've been doing it for several years and um, I, I got, you know, my a really good education when I took the tour and I would urge each of you to take the audio tour when you have the opportunity, whether you live in Kansas City or not. It mm -hmm. does explain so much of this region's development yes. and the problems that are systemic and have a, we have a long way to go in dealing with and, and yeah. maybe why that is. So and I think it's important to note too, for just context wise, our bus tour, the reason why we were able to create the content behind that, we researched it and we printed guides for people to sit on a bus and read it and understand each landmark. Freedom's Frontier was a primary funder of that work. And fast forward to when we went ahead and we did our audio version of it, Freedom's Frontier also stepped in there. And so a lot of the work, the foundational work that we have done is rooted in this organization. And so it's an exciting time to continue to see growth. Um, the audio tour, our plans, so as long as we can figure out the funding is to take it and create a video version of it. Because a, one of the cool things about the audio tour is it's good to do it with people, but we know we can't do that right now. And so the video would allow folks to experience it at the same time and have discussions. And also a video can be accessed by anyone around the country. So all of our communities across this country have a very similar story when it comes to redlining and block listing. So it's exciting to think about the growth there. General? Uh, do, do you uh, participate with any of the, the uh, partner sites? We have worked with Brown v. Board. Okay. So when we hosted ta Coates, we also, Tanner Colby, we had an event at Brown v. Board with, with author Tanner Colby. Okay. And I can add something to that that I didn't have an opportunity to share with uh, Angel, but the National Park Service has approved uh, our cooperative agreement with Brown v. Board and it is through that cooperative agreement that is now extended for another four years that money was provided that uh, helped to support these authors being involved. And in fact, uh, uh, we just got that word, Sherda Williams, the superintendent of Brown v. Board, uh, yesterday afternoon. So that was good news uh, to get the final paperwork in, Angel and uh, it will lead to further conversations going forward along that. Anything else that anybody would like to ask or comment on? Then if not, then I think we're ready to vote on the motion and I would ask those on video to raise their hand in favor of the funding motion. Um, all in favor, raise their hand. Opposed? All on the phone, say aye. 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 All on the phone, say nay. The ayes have it unanimously again. You're a unanimous group today. That's wonderful. Thank you, Angel, for that great presentation. And most importantly, for the good work you're doing. And please share our thanks with an enthusiasm with your entire staff. Uh, Thank it's, you. It's really a wonderful program. Um, Jim, uh, do you have anything further on the on the race project? Not on the race project, but some of the other equal, uh, equality task force programs. Yes. Well, uh, go ahead. So uh, among the elements um, was that we have taken advantage of. International Underground Railroad Month. Uh, last year, it was marked for the first time in Maryland um, and uh, the National Center uh, for the Network to Freedom is now, that office is based out of Maryland uh, as well. And they were able to celebrate it last year. On July 1st, they ask, uh, ask across the country for uh, participation from heritage areas and the like, we
quickly swung into action with a number of our partners. Um, since that time, Missouri Governor Parson has uh, issued a proclamation making September International Underground Railroad Month uh, as a celebration uh, in Missouri. Kansas Governor Laura Kelly uh, plans to do the same in Governor Kelly's uh, effort supported by uh, the tourism office for the state of Kansas. They're recording a video at a number of Kansas yeah. uh, Underground Railroad Network to Freedom sites where a young person will read a section of the proclamation, uh, all ending with Governor Kelly reading the last parts of the proclamation. Uh, the state plans to aggressively market that, as do we, um, along the way. And that expected to be released on September 1st as part of that effort. Along with the International Underground Railroad Month, uh, we are working with the partners who are on the Network to Freedom uh, in producing a total of 10 digital programs are planned uh, each one exploring the different story behind the Network to Freedom at each of those sites. And we'll be releasing that schedule soon so that people can sign up for the variety of the webinars uh, that will occur during the month of September, all associated with the Underground Railroad. And Johnny has been at work uh, developing a special Underground Railroad Network to Freedom tour for the sites that will allow people to go to those sites, experience why they're on the, on the tour, but also uh, to uh, utilize the ability for us to provide badges so that people can collect digital badges uh, for each of those sites along the way. So it will be a major effort in the month of September in support of the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom uh, and our sites throughout Kansas and Missouri along the way. Uh, as Grant also mentioned, we have had uh, really wonderful uh, participation by many of you in um, our Tuesday night discussions. Our fourth week is coming up this coming Tuesday at five o'clock. If any of you all would like to join in, just let me know and I'll add you to the distribution list for the uh, elements that we are attempting to read, watch, and listen to, one element each for each of the weeks of the participation. So just let me know with an email if you'd like to participate uh, along the way. And I will tell you that I've received a couple of written proposals so far, and I have uh, about 10 additional organizations have indicated to me that they plan to submit a proposal for the partner discussion grant that you approved at the July meeting. Hmm. So um, we'll know exactly how many do as we get to September 1st, and then we will engage the uh, partner advisory group to evaluate and score those and make a recommendation back to you all um, in the October board meeting about what the funding matrix should look like. Uh, as you know, in our original RFP that we put out, we said that uh, we look to uh, dedicate $5,000 for Kansas and $5,000 for Missouri. And uh, we'll see if they want to stay within those confines or might suggest other opportunities uh, and another funding amount uh, in the recommendation to you from the October board meeting. And those are the elements I wanted to share from uh, what we're trying to accomplish to uh, advance in these areas. Uh, Jim, I, I would like to give the opportunity for um, those board members that are participating in the reading group uh, that we meet on Tuesday nights, uh, if you would like to share any of your experiences with the rest of the group and uh, maybe so that people are comfortable in maybe joining us. You don't have to have listened to the first three weeks in order to uh, 
join us for week four. Uh, it's, it's something that you can pick up and grow from at any point along the way. Um, generally, would you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us? Uh, not at this time, thanks. Okay. Anyone else about our reading group? Kristen? No, we're, we're mom. Okay. So, yeah, I, I just want to say that um, I went into the first session. Um, I don't want to say I was leery about it, but I just didn't know what to expect. And um, I have found them to be uh, one of the most enjoyable hours of my week. So um, I encourage those who haven't participated to, to get involved. John? Sessions are at five o'clock after your work day. And uh, they're very uh, well held within the hour. But what is of real value is the preparation for the meeting, which basically comes down to about uh, less than an hour's time dedicated to visiting sites uh, of varying lengths that help educate you and orient you to the discussion on the issues of race and prejudice. And uh, it, it uh, in total makes a very lively conversation and quite uh, uh, engaging as well as educational. I think the, the other piece I see is it's powerful to be able to be in a space and read something, talk about it, but then you end up sharing your stories, right? And so like on the call that I was on, not this week, but last, you know, or two weeks prior, um, general, your stories stood out to me, like where I thought I heard something that I will remember and take with me. And so I think there's power in storytelling. It's what we do. It's what we really stand on with Race Project, so. Well, and in that regard, uh, Angel, um, I plan to be in the Kansas City area until uh, mid-September. And if there's any, uh, you know, anything I can do to help your project, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for uh, sharing. Uh, and again, the doors open for others that'd like to join us. And the, uh, my wife is joining us and the Angel's son has joined us. So it is open to your family or significant other in your life uh, to join in the conversation. Uh, so I guess we'll move on to next item, which is project success. And um, Larry, would you like to start with that? Yeah, actually, I'm going to defer to uh, Jim and Johnny on this one. Uh, project success, just to remind you, is uh, the success has to do with the success of our launch of the Freedom's Frontier app. And uh, we've been busy working on that for uh, many months. And uh, we've uh, had a little bit of a lull here lately, but uh, I'll, I think Jim has the latest information on that. Okay. I, thank you, Larry. I, uh, uh, Larry had been on vacation and I put him on the agenda and then didn't send him anything. <laughs> um, uh, so he, I wouldn't say that. I didn't want to say that. So, uh, so <laughs> I, I have effectively waylaid him in the process along the way. Um, uh, we have been very much at work. Uh, we've gotten a tremendous commitment from Kansas tourism to supporting, uh, the app, uh, both in their newsletters that they send out uh, their online materials that they're going to do. And of course, they're paying this whole video production with the governor and the like, Kansas Tourism is paying for. And it uh, helps promote Freedom's Frontier and our app in the process. So I'm excited about that. I've also had the opportunity uh, to do a lot of presentations to clubs and groups. And in each one of them, I have made the app kind of the central uh, uh, element to connect to these wonderful stories that we've got to tell and to get people to download it. Uh, we have some specific projects tied to the app that will, I think, be very valuable to get downloads. Um, in Lawrence, uh, each year, uh, they mark uh, Quantrill's raid with the Civil War on the Western Frontier. 
And have, if you remember last year, because we had tied our um, a symposium disorder on the border to that event, we had nearly 900 people be involved in their programs and our programs kind of seen in the community together. Well, this year, of course, we can't do those kind of programs, but they developed a walking tour of the sites. And Johnny, uh, if he weren't sitting in on the meeting right now, he would be able to continue to work on finishing adding all those elements to the walking tour that will be on the app. And the Watkins Museum, to all of its people, will be promoting to download the app and do the walking tour as part of Civil War on the West, Western Frontier. Um, our Douglas partners as well are working as a group to create a kind of history event in October, uh, the Great Douglas County History Hunt, <coughs> which you will collect badges by visiting different sites and their exterior displays. And that history hunt for you to be able to register and get the badges will require the use of our app as well. So I'm excited that we're getting these initial uh, footholds with groups that are uh, helping us in the promotion of the app um, and uh, acknowledging the app. And we will be making regular reports to you as part of project success of the progress we make on downloads. And as we meet uh, with clusters of our uh, uh, partner sites about how they can market the app uh, and share the app among their members. Hey, Jim, I have a question. Um, do you think from your app there would be a way for us to um, link the Dividing Lines audio tour? I don't know if that's possible. Uh, we actually attempted to look at that and all of the elements could be transferred over, but it will take some work to work out with you all about how you created it. I got gotcha. you. So okay. I'm confident we can do that, but I knew rather than try to add that to your list at just the, the moment, mm -hmm. uh, something I hope we can talk about down here down the road. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I just wanted to mention, um, uh, for the benefit of our new board members as, as well as the old board members. Uh, I mean, if you really want to uh, appreciate the richness of the heritage area, you can really use this, use this app to start perusing uh, information about uh, all of our sites. And it's a great way to educate yourself about the heritage area and uh, you know the, the the richness of the uh, of the history that we have to tell so i would just recommend it to anybody uh as an educational tool and not just a uh, not just a uh, a guide to how to get from here to there and um i'd also point out uh, thank you for that larry um part of our effort as you mentioned education um is to utilize the development of the app uh, to create distance learning opportunities and uh, COVID safe field trips for families with their students uh, utilizing the app. Um, there is a funding proposal right now uh, that uh, is being considered uh, as part of a group uh, under the Douglas County uh, COVID funding since we're located there uh, that would help support us in that if it passed and would provide funding for us to create uh, and promote this to not only teachers to use in public schools, but also uh, help us do outreach to homeschooling as well. General? I have a technical question. Do apps take up a lot of uh, uh, space, storage space, on your device? Um, uh, a lot is one of those, it depends on your, what you already got on it. Um, uh, if you have, uh, if you download uh, the material, it's about a five to six megabyte uh, app in terms of its database that resides and gets updated. 
so that you have quick access. So mm -hmm. if your memory is 128 uh, uh, gigs, that's really not much of a problem. Um, if you have a smaller base phone that has much more limited memory, uh, any collection of apps could start pushing you against that. Yeah, thank you. Boundary. I have a comment to make. Uh, one of the things I do as an architect is I'm involved with the IMLS Institute of Museums and Library Science, conducting uh, cultural assessment programs with facilities like museums, visitor centers across the United States. Typically my services are really on a more regional basis, but recently I was contacted both by uh, uh, San Jose, and South Carolina, Columbus, South Carolina, as well as uh, Nebraska and Wisconsin to conduct CAP surveys of facilities for these people. And when I speak to them, I let them know that some of my background is Freedom's Frontier. And I always enjoy them saying, what is that? And that opens the door for me to be able to shove that app in their face. <laughs> and uh, I've had some very good replies uh, because of the educational nature. They found it very accessible and very quickly being able to see the uh, integration. And uh, for an area like Kansas City, and Angel, I want you to listen to this, because it tackled some of these problems about 30 years ago. Um, along with the idea of the expanding suburbs, which is a conveyance that Nichols came up with uh, for the segregation that we have, is it also includes a single family detached dwelling as a unit of residence. And that detachment has been very prophetic in terms of the way that we live in that environment. You don't have to know your neighbors. You don't have to engage in social contract to be able to communicate and live with people. So a lot of those skills and talents that one learns about living in a civil manner have been lost to the vehicle of suburbanism. Now we have an app, which as you know, heretofore, history only resided on the two shores of the North American continent. We can inform people now that a lot of what's going on in the United States related to segregation actually has a great deal to do with the central United States. So I'm very pleased to be able to share that with somebody from South Carolina who believes that the entire Civil War started in their shores. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually I introduced them to people like uh, John Brown, who obviously has only been in Virginia, right? Harper's Ferry. So the astonishment that people have is incredible. And I'm very pleased to be the educator of that. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Jim, you have the next two items, I think, uh, on the agenda, uh, partner meetings. Um, we have been in a process that shifted all our partner meetings to online, and we've been utilizing the Monday Minute as a tool to get information out. Um, one of the things that came in feedback from uh, our attempt to do uh, replicate the more traditional partner meeting in the online setting. And Angel spoke to it a little bit ago uh, when she said that uh, you can't do much more than two and a half hours. Was that it, what you said, Angel? Um, I can tell you the people who have taken the surveys for our, the partner meeting we did that ran about two and a half hours don't want to sit for two and a half hours. Um, about an hour is what uh, they identified as a sweet spot. So we've tried to keep programs focused in that way to have a couple of small sharing experiences combined with one headliner. Uh, you would have seen that uh, with uh, uh, Travels with Sarah that we did on July 27th. We have other partner meetings coming up um, 
that are going to be about the app, an opportunity to explore uh, some of the other elements that we have going on, uh, like uh, Mark Adams is planning to do a presentation uh, before it reopens on the Truman Institute um, and its expansion and remodeling of the Harry Truman Library. That sort of thing, we're trying to make programs available that will engage partners and create greater mm -hmm. connectivity along the way. So that's part of what we're doing with the partner meetings and the like. Uh, any questions or comments? Because I know many of you represent partners. I appreciate any feedback you'd like to offer. Then I'll move on to the next item on the agenda, and that is reauthorization and ANHA update. Um, the effort to try to get an amendment passed uh, is part of uh, the Save America Treasures Act uh, was blocked by uh, the majority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell uh, had had significant difficulties getting everyone to agree to the original bill, and he did not want to have it devolve with amendments of any kind, um, and figured that if he would allow even one amendment, uh, it would open the door for everybody to put amendments in. And so using his powers as majority leader, he blocked that. So we currently don't have um, an, an easy path to reauthorization uh, that would have come through that. However, there is still a, an effort afoot uh, as part of a giant omnibus bill uh, to be completed by the Congress uh, before it goes into its election recess to include the provisions of the ANHA uh, uh, legislation that is currently before the Congress and to have it passed as a series of items inside that bill. So I'm hopeful about that. Our lobbyists from the National Park Foundation are hopeful about this as well. So um, I will keep you posted as I know something along the way. Um, secondly, uh, I'm pleased to report that appropriation staff from both the Senate and the House have put in a provision to increase the funding for heritage areas in the next budget which is October 1st of this year through September 30th of 2021, of about $2 million for the 55 heritage areas mm. as a group. So for us, if that is all distributed on an equal basis, we'll amount to probably about $35,000 in addition to our funding uh, that we've gotten in previous years. Um, and uh, we're very excited about that. And we don't expect uh, the process to be one that anybody's going to go down into that and zero that out. Um, I think both sides of the Capitol don't want a government shutdown starting October 1st and are looking for a way to get all the appropriation bills passed. Um, successfully. So uh, I'm, I'm encouraged and, and hopeful about our base funding. As I mentioned, this is kind of an extension to that. Um, there are the two other funding opportunities. Uh, we're part of a consortium about that distance learning and where that comes in and what it ends up being uh, finally approved. We'll know within a few days um, out of what the request was with Douglas County. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, gotten the approval from the interior region, which is the office based out of Omaha that covers us. And in the interior region, uh, they've approved uh, 
Brown versus Board providing uh, money for this cooperative agreement. That uh, the plan is thirty thousand dollars each year will be moved from Brown's um, allocation from the federal government and be available for projects uh, that we mutually agree on. It was a source of funding for a number of the projects we did over the last couple of years to engage authors uh, and bring them here associated with uh, Race Project KC. But part of the funding also, it was um, uh, Sherta Williams' intent that uh, Brown was committing uh, $5,000 of that to paying costs associated with the development and execution of the app in each of those years going forward. Wow, that's great. Any questions for Jim on those issues? Uh, before we adjourn, I would like, um, maybe Gary needs to weigh in on here too, Jim, but uh, we're, we're in the process of looking for an associate director and um, maybe the why and the how and um, the timeline, just so everybody's up to date on, on that development, which I think is very important for the organization. Gary, you wanna kind of give some background for the need? Well, yeah, I'll just say that um, the personnel committee has been working with Jim to uh, make some adjustments in staff. Um, we feel pretty strongly that we need to um, build back up from um, where we have been um, earlier this year to a higher level of, of staffing programmatically. Um, we're trying to do an awful lot of things that we simply don't have the staff to accomplish. And uh, one of the things that we want to do is uh, hire an assistant director to Jim so that um, he has the ability to focus on what the executive director should be doing and not all of the other things that he's had to do in the last year. Um, and um, we work with him to prepare a, a job description for that role. And I know that it's on the street at, 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 as we speak. Um, Jim, I'll let you kind of fill in from there. Um, I have had uh, four interviews with applicants. I have four more app applicants to do interviews with. Um, it was my intent to uh, continue to encourage people to apply uh, through the month of August and uh, complete these in, uh, first round of interviews and then have a meeting with uh, the personnel committee about what I think our steps going forward should be. I, I'm sorry to put you guys on the spot, but I just thought we ought to address that since we're on, sure. the, on the market. And if you know somebody that might be a good candidate, uh, be sure to talk to Jim and pass along the name. General? Question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what's the salary range of the position? Uh, uh, Forty-five to fifty thousand dollars. Is that consistent with uh, the level of uh, expertise that uh, you know other organizations like ours is charging? Yes. Okay. And can I just ask, is that based in, in uh, Kansas or the position? Uh, quite frankly, Chip, that is a very much an open question, I think, right now, given what we've been dealing with over the last few months. Um, clearly, the office is in Lawrence, um, but how we do this work um, I think we have to take a serious look at uh, in where people do the work from. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add to that that um, the world is changing, obviously. And in my view, um, 
the hire would not have to work in the office on a regular schedule. Um, I think if they, um, I think I think one of the requirements of the position, actually, given the job description, is that they would have to have transportation and be mobile um, in the first place. So um, if they visited periodically um, in the office, that would be more than adequate. Mm -hmm. Flexibility is a key word for us and for them. <laughs> Okay, does anybody else have anything to uh, add for the good of the order? Well, again, I thank you for your time and your commitment and your participation in our various activities. If you don't feel engaged, let us know and we'll uh, make sure that you have that opportunity. I also encourage you to uh, join our Tuesday group if that works with your schedule uh, and, and grow a little. So thank you everyone and stay safe. What, when's our next meeting? Uh, October 14. Uh, it'll be a Zoom meeting, one o'clock. At least that's what the agenda says. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.